The roads are very dangerous places. We know that all too well. We're always called to be watchful even at the Artana crossroads, looking left and right and right again before you cross the road. How many times have you forgotten to look again and in a moment the car appears and you realize that you could have been injured or your life even could have been taken? Surely if you look back at this week that has passed and the circumstances that have brought us here, are there not so many moments of deliverance that we have taken so lightly? and not pause to thank God for. When we think of the many threats to our life, the many dangers that are daily before us, the many close accidents that we nearly have, or preservation from more serious injury, do we ever come to God and thank him that these daily deliverances are surely a picture for us of the great deliverance that we will experience in Christ from death itself. As we appear here at public worship, which no doubt in itself is a series of miracles and remarkable preservations in this week, we will in Christ appear before him, which is that great moment of deliverance into life everlasting. For the Israelites singing these series of psalms in this portion of the Psalter, sung at the Passover, and even here this Psalm 114, taking the great picture of deliverance from the exodus of Egypt, it was before their minds that their identity as a people, not some lost group of ethnic slaves, intermarried and mingled and lost in the Egyptian world, but people who emerged, continuing to be the covenant people of God to inherit the land set and promised before them. They would be delivered to the land of Canaan. And as the letter to the Hebrews picks up that picture, God's people will be delivered into that eternal rest, that eternal Canaan that is waiting for us in Christ Jesus. This psalm affirms for us the character of God, that he is the deliverer. It pictures those things as he mocks them that would be a barrier to deliverance, and nothing will prevent the promise what is set out for his people. We are called to be his, we are delivered to be his, And we are also preserved to be his. Firstly then in those first two verses of the psalm. We are called to be his. Israel went out of Egypt from a people of a strange language. How was it strange after those centuries of living there? Could they not speak it? Was it not the common second language along with Hebrew? Surely it wasn't strange for them. But at what point did it become strange? These people's language was not using the name of God. They were daily daily invoking the false gods of Egypt and swearing by them and making promises by them as they beat the Hebrew slaves. No doubt their oaths were filled with those terrible gods of Egypt. This was becoming a strange language. Not so at the start. It was a place of refuge. When Jacob and his family came down, it was a place novel in its strangeness. It was a place where because they were Joseph's family, they were specially privileged. And it's a bit like us, perhaps, if we go somewhere and It's like a dream holiday and we experience it and think, wouldn't it be lovely just to to live here and be in this place forever? But you may find that after a time, you're not really part of these people. The weather is nice, the beach is nice, the scenery is nice, but will you really be accepted? Are you really one of them? Are there any people among them, Christian people? Is there any fellowship? Is there any hope? And suddenly you say, well, this is not my home. How long in this world do we live 
to realize that this is not our home. The conduct of this world being under the wrath of God means that we will be delivered from that wrath in Christ Jesus. We are not under condemnation if we know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. But this world is. Why would we not wish to be fully delivered into that new creation, into that new world that God promises in Christ? In Egypt, it was lovely for a time. But over the years, they suddenly discovered that they were slaves. God had promised for them deliverance to somewhere. And that was to that land promised. Jacob going down into Egypt, his descendants had been promised the land of Canaan that he had left. Out of Egypt, God called his son Israel. Judah later would be the place of his dwelling, and Zion would be that place chosen for the temple and the place of the sanctuary. And Israel itself would be an example to the world of what deliverance is unheard of in the events of Exodus. And that is why it is so remarkable being sung about and as a picture for our deliverance from sin. But this deliverance required their obedience to God. Or Israel would remain undelivered. The covenant that was set to them that daubing their doorposts with the blood of the sacrificial lamb sacrificed in place of the firstborn, that the angel of death would pass over. They received God's grace as they fulfilled their side of that covenant promise. But the people of God were called to be his, and he proved it by being their actual deliverer and bringing them from this land and this place of slavery. But their whole identity was focused upon deliverance and salvation. Looking there at verse 3 and 4, describing some of those things that would be the barrier to deliverance. They were delivered to be his. Not delivered just to be abandoned on the face of the earth, but delivered to be a delivered people. People use that term when we think of someone says that they are saved. It is a condition. You are saved from the wrath of God and against the consequences of your sin. But it is a situation where we are not left alone, but we are in a process serving God of looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth. We are delivered to be his. We are saved to be his, and nothing can prevent that. The covenant was made by the sovereign God, and he has proved that again and again. Christ speaking to the Pharisees, people who knew all about the Exodus, the Scripture, the covenant God, and the Psalms that they sang, their hearts were so hardened, even Christ demonstrating by his works that he was the Son of God. But they, not being the sheep of the fold, did not hear that call and would not be delivered by their good works, by their attempts at law-keeping. It would not be theirs unless they belonged to the Good Shepherd. How wonderful to be called and enabled and persuaded to answer to know the promise that the great good shepherd has kept. There is the stamp on your letters, has the picture of the king and a price that is paid and a guarantee. It is King Jesus who has paid that price. And he stands over that guarantee that all who bear the mark of Christ and the work of salvation will be delivered. And we will appear before God in glory. Sovereign God makes a promise. He says what he does. And he will move heaven and earth to fulfill that promise. Egypt was not the home for the covenant people. 
Indeed, as in their resistance to the God of Israel and the plagues that came upon Israel, it made Egypt less of a home because more and more they despised these Israelites who God, whose God had brought the plagues upon them. This word, as we think that came from God, as we know came from God, was direct against the Egyptians and those in authority. It was, let these people go. But it's not that the Egyptians would somehow take the glory of, of being great. Let them go out and worship God and their God in the desert, and then we'll catch them and bring them back again. It was by the authority of God speaking against a nation that was judged for its own disobedience. But we belong to an eternal kingdom, a nation, as it were, of God's people, the people of Zion, who do not stand under condemnation. We have that banner of God's deliverance that is raised high for all the nations to see. And indeed, the nation of Egypt was shaken. The wilderness was shaken. Canaan was shaken. That God's people would enter in deliverance to this promise. Under God, nothing would prevent his call to be fulfilled. But the test came for the Israelites. Did they believe in this deliverer? They had to sacrifice They had to engage with the Passover promise. They had to leave with the few possessions that they had. They had to go to the desert. They had to stand at the shores of the Red Sea. They had to, in faith, believe that they would part and they would not be drowned. They had to believe that they would be delivered from the Pharaoh's armies and they were removed from the scene as the water closed over them. They had also to believe that they would enter into Canaan as the spies came and encouraged them to do so, the the two spies. But they did not believe. And they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, being chastised for their disobedience and their unbelief in the Deliverer. But when that moment came, would the Jordan part? Would the Canaanites resist? Would Jericho fall? Yes, they would fall. Yes, the Jordan would part because God is the deliverer. The sea saw it and fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. Nothing would prevent God's deliverance from taking place. How we are challenged so often in our faith to step out into these promises, to enter into the hope that is promised. Let the sea roar. Let creation, let life do its greatest. Let the mountains quake. Our God is greater than all these things. Let the nations be shaken. Let your health be shaken. Let your home be shaken. Let your money be shaken. Let your hopes and ambitions be shaken. God is greater than all these things. And in Christ you will be delivered. And you will not be plucked out of his hands. If you're his sheep, you have heard his voice. Are you his sheep? Have you heard his voice? Do you know in your hearts the deliverance of God? Called to be his, he has set his grace upon us. We are delivered to be his. Moving heavens, he has come down as the Lord Jesus Christ taking on the form of a servant to be made sin for us. Thirdly, we are preserved to be his. Yes, we are delivered from the consequences of our sin and our nature. We know that. We have that guarantee. But yet we struggle with sin. And we have the rest of our life here or until the Lord returns on our Christian pathway to deal with these trials. How the Lord brings these difficulties to us. 
he brings us grace to bear them. But ultimately, remember God is more powerful. He is the one who preserves us. He is the one who is called, and we will know that ultimate deliverance. But we are already in a state of deliverance. Just as we are, we will know the fullness of salvation. We are in the position where we are saved. But there is that measure of hope that is yet ahead. God, in a sense, mocks those things that would be a barrier to deliverance. Sees them how pathetic that they are. What, what ails you, O oh, sea, that you fled away? It wasn't that there was a dam built by the Israelites, or there wasn't that they put a huge explosion in it or something or else. It was at the word of God that the waters fled. The sea, the Red Sea, the Jordan that turned back. In the great flood, at that moment it was the harvest floods in the land of Canaan. The least likely time that the river would ever dry up. And in that moment, the river dried up and stopped as the priests put their foot into the water on the river banks. Why did the mountains skip like rams? There was no mountain barriers to the journey to Canaan. It is because God preserves his people in his promise. The enemy at the Red Sea showed the disregard for the God of Israel. Charging on thinking that the slaves would be delivered back again into their hands. But they were judged. But the Israelites were delivered safely through. But how many times on the journey through the wilderness the devil was busy sowing seeds of fear and doubt. These are things yet true in the church. The devil is so busy in our hearts, in our homes, in our lives, causing us to doubt that we have been plucked out of God's hand or that he has let us drop or he has cast us aside. These temptations are very real for the believer and we must be aware of them. So then we must be aware of the promise that Christ expresses to those people who were of hardened heart in John's Gospel, chapter 10. He was telling people who were not of his sheep that his sheep will be delivered in the end. What do you think they should have done? What do you think anyone would have done? Well, they would have fallen before the God of heaven and cried out for repent in repentance, for deliverance, for salvation. And what did they do instead? They lifted their hands with stones to put Jesus to death. What a weird and strange response. But if we neglect the salvation and the deliverance that is offered to us, we are doing exactly the same thing. We are saying, away from me, you deliverer. I do not want deliverance. You're with these Pharisees lifting a stone to put Jesus to death. You're putting your hands in your ears that you do not hear the word of the gospel and the hope that is offered to you. That you will be delivered. And no one will remove you from that position and hope of deliverance in Christ Jesus. We must believe the promise of God that we will be delivered to that eternal destination. We must obey the God of salvation. We must look to the promised land that is set before us. But we also look around us and see the many barriers that seem to be there. The floods that would go over our soul. The trials that would turn back our hope. Those mountains that seem erected as a barrier in our path. The many reasons that the devil puts before us to cause us to doubt the perseverance and the preserving hand of God. Think of those Israelites and their many testings in the wilderness. And how they submitted to the trials of those 40 extra years when they could have been in Canaan in a matter of weeks. But God is the one in his power will bring us to that place. All who are appointed will appear before him in Zion 
as Psalm 84 sings. Christ himself, as he made this statement to these hard-hearted Pharisees, he was also sure of the Father's covenant promise. So why should we doubt it? Well, we do doubt it because we're all too aware of our sinfulness and our unrepentance. The answer then is repent. Seek forgiveness from God. Seek as we grow in sanctification to daily be more assured of Christ as your faith grows. God is the one who sits enthroned in heaven and laughs, laughs even at the devil's attempt to confound his works. Jordan and flood was not enough. The Red Sea in its depth was not enough. The walls of Jericho, the soldiers of armies of Canaan well prepared were not enough. The earth trembled in the presence of the true and living God. He is the one who brought water from the, the rock of flint, the hardest rock, and it broke open and water came forth, or bread came from the heavens. He provides for his people that we would be preserved and we would be delivered. The psalm which we will now sing is a song of joy. These people are our spiritual forebears and ancestors. These people in the church of the Old Testament were at least yearly reminded of the deliverance at the time of the Passover and surely daily as they rose and thought of themselves as a people, they remembered the deliverance of God. Describes for us that joy. Do you know that joy? Joy of what God has done for you in Christ and what he will do in the fullness of deliverance that we might enter in. We are here. Preserved by God. We are called by God. We are chosen by God. We are delivered by God into this place to think again of this message, to think again of this promise and this hope that no one will pluck you out of the Father's hand. Amen.